It was in the museum. Great. I think it was send the link to me. <laughs> it may send it to you now that you're the host. I send it to me and then I'll just send it to you. Yeah, just forward yeah. me an email. I think it's going to send it to me since I set up the oh, yeah. original session. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we're just missing one. We're uh, still a few more people. We'll, we'll give it a couple more minutes. Yeah. Let's see, so we're missing Ray and Daph, I think, right? Don't see them here quite yet. Maybe we'll give, we'll, we'll give till 3.35 um, and then we'll proceed and they might join us. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so Fernando, the way that we did this, uh, we had Sophie McIntosh in our class last week and we can kind of do it however we want, but I know that everybody's got questions for you. Um, I don't know if there's like anything you want to say to get us started, um, but otherwise um, we can use this hour um, in whatever way we want, uh, but we had a lot of fun talking about your book and, and I know we've got some questions for you. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. No, I don't have anything to add. Yeah. So let's, let's go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we can do what we did uh, last week where just kind of unmute yourself uh, whenever you are ready to ask a question and we'll just kind of have it be a conversation like that. Hi, my name is uh, Mason. Thank you so much for, for talking to us today. Something that we talked a lot about in class was the the truffle pig uh, itself, and specifically its physical appearance. And we were, I was wondering sort of where the inspiration came for what the truffle pig actually looked like. 
Yes. Uh, you know, this was, uh, I think, an important aspect of it or something that I thought about a lot, you know, and I, uh, something that a creature that came to mind for me was like the platypus, you know, how the platypus is like this combination of different creatures. And I wondered if that, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, represented something about the land. So I really thought about what is what kind of animals exist in this land uh, in South Texas. And I thought about like lizards and like pigs for some reason and birds. So I, I kind of combined this imagery together and also uh, I was very much influenced by work by like Jorge Luis Borges and like the the uh, book of imaginary beings in particular which is like a compendium of imaginary creatures that have existed in literature and I thought that that concept was really interesting to me and I think it's an observation that Borges himself made how for example the dragon how the dragon is a creature that exists only in our imagination you know it has existed for a long time in our imagination and how important how powerful it is that there's creatures that exist only in our imagination you know and because they come to symbolize something something and uh i thought you know like you know i would that i would like to you know as, as a young writer i always wanted like to uh to perhaps come up with a creature that would be added to the book of imaginary beings yeah. if the book of imaginary beings was a thing a big collaborative thing that everybody would do you know so to me like all these elements just came together uh yeah naturally like with those uh with those things in mind i guess i don't know if i answered your question but we talked about how we a, wish that the cover almost we, we love the cover but we wish we wanted like a picture of the truffle pig like we wanted <laughs> that's funny yeah you know when uh when uh yeah i'm sure you know you know this yourself Misha, but, uh, uh then when they give you like i don't know if the art department the art department gave me like a sheet of paper like and the first question is like what 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 do you not want your cover to look mm -hmm. like you know and i thought a lot about kafka and how kafka for kafka it was important that the that the insect that the that the insect not be pictured on the cover of the Metamorphosis, which was one of the few books, uh, stories of Kafka's got published in his lifetime, and uh, so I thought it was really really important for uh, the an artist to not give the reader an image of what the truffle pig <laughs> would look like, because uh, I wanted like the reader the truffle pig to exist like this like every reader would have their own interpretation of the truffle pig, depending on their own, uh, you know, uh, their own, you know, being, you know, their own imagination. So I thought it was really, really important also to not to, it was like a, a I guess a balance of mi minimalism and maximalism, you know, have this maximalist imaginary creature, but described in the most minimal way possible, you know, to, to give the, the reader room to imagine this creature, you know, fill it in with their brains, you know. Hi, I'm Devin. I also had a question and you were mentioning Borges as probably one of the beginning parts of imagining the truffle pig and an aspect of research. So I wanted to ask how you started researching for this, for this project and little basis of getting books or getting ideas together just that entire process for you yes you know my research for this you know i wanted to approach it when i was when i started writing it i, I called it the anti-research novel because the research that i would do would have to be with the ingredients that i already have in my mind the only actual research that i did was in uh i had to read up about the olmec heads i didn't know a lot about the technical nature of them you know Growing up, I grew up on the border. So growing up, and my, almost all my family lives in Mexico. So growing up, we would, when we would cross over on the International Bridge, there was this huge Olmec head on there. And it wasn't until I was like maybe 21 or 22 that I that I just that I discovered that it wasn't a real Olmec head. It was a replica of an Olmec head. So to me, like imagery like that, uh, yeah, it just it just came to me just just was was important to the book to have all these uh, technical details that were accurate, 
but as far as like research and stuff like that i i did as little of it as possible so that i could be i guess as free as possible in my brain and by free i mean so that i can uh get in and out as fast as possible you know i see i i i see now like like my approach to this novel was almost like i hate to say it but like a bank robbery you know to get in and out as fast as possible and that's how i approach a lot of short stories you know i i don't like to work on a story more than a short story more than like two weeks in the first draft so just getting it out as fast as possible if i need to fix anything i'll come back to it later but i just wanted i felt that i i was tapping into something i didn't want to lose the thread of it so every day i had to work to it and the research that I did was as minimalist as possible. And also, I think what was important for me was I thought about like literary history was very really important for me here. And I thought about like this land, like Texas and fantastical literature, which isn't really represented in fantastical literature. The few works that I can think of are like the works of Robert E. Howard, who's famous for like the Conan series, but he also wrote a lot of these weird off weird stories that take place in this prehistoric Texas land. And I thought, okay, I'm going to want to write a, a story as if we as if the border had evolved from this place, you know, and uh, the Bella Cosa character similarly. I saw him as like, you know, I thought about like uh, Don Quixote, the character of Don Quixote, and I'm like, okay, uh, Don Quixote, his great, great grandchildren eventually moved to the, to like came to Coney Island and somehow made their way down to Texas. And somehow Bella Cosa was like, uh, his ancestor was Don Quixote himself, you know, so. It was important for me to have these connections, but to never mention them within the book and just for me to know them as I go forward, you know. Sorry for rambling there for a bit. Hi, I had a question. Um, one of my favorite parts of this book were your use of metaphors. Some of them were just super wild. Uh, and I, I am just like genuinely curious about like, how do things like, the night was young it smelled like a dry water fountain or like the he moved like a spider with two missing legs like how do those things come to you you know i give myself permission you know when i was a younger writer when i was like in my 20s i would have a list of things like if a writer would say never do this in a story or i i or i hate it when stories do this i would have a list of these things and I would try to make these things that the writer has said that they're against work, you know? So I'm like, I realize I, re I know what this writer's saying. Like, I guess uh, one of the things that I remember is like uh, Jonathan Franzen, like 11 years ago said something like, he hates it when like a sentence starts with the word of, you know? And I'm like, and I'm like, what? Or like with the story starts with the word. And so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna write a short story. My first letter, my first word is gonna be of, and I'm gonna just make it work, you know? And I realized, okay, it works. You can make these rules work according to what your story is, you know? So because uh, this story, like I said, is like a balance of minimalism and maximalism, I allowed myself uh, extravagant metaphors like that occasionally to give shape to, 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 the, to the world because I didn't, I feel always that the text and the way you write your book should reflect the story itself that you're telling, you know? So, so, so uh, also something that I get asked occasionally is about, about the genre, how it seems to be like, there seems to be like a little bit of every genre. And, uh, and similarly, I feel that, you know, this story is like, on, it takes place on the border. So it's like on the border also of all these genres, you know, uh, it's like, on, it's like uh, the, the detective fiction, fiction on the border with noir on the border with speculative fiction and things like that. So uh, it was important for me to, uh, you know, to allow myself, I guess, extravagant things like that. And I think, you know, you know, people as writers, like writers should allow themselves freedoms to do something crazy, you know, every now and then. I don't know, you know. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. 
Hi, my name's Arlo. I have a I have a question. So you you built a world with a lot of sort of surreal elements, um, but the story also addresses a lot of familiar topics like elitism and like the marginalization of native people. And I was kind of curious whether you started writing the story knowing you would use sort of these science fiction surreal elements to talk about those things, or if that's something you sort of discovered as you wrote. Yes, uh, you know, and uh, something that is very important to me also in the writing of it, you know, I'm always really jealous of like, not jealous, but I wish there was like, I'd like to incorporate performative aspects to my writing. So I wrote this whole manuscript, the first draft on a typewriter. And I like that I can pace around and when you type on a typewriter is loud and it's, uh, it's violent, you know, hearing the keys. So I thought a lot about the early 20th century Russian constructivist movement and the writers that came from that movement, such as, such as uh, Daniel Harms or uh, Andrei Platonov a few decades later, writers who wrote kind of outside of the socialist realism that uh, the only that was the only type of literature that could be written in uh, Russia's the Soviet Union, Russia at the time. Uh, and so it was important for me to try and I guess understand those writers and to ask myself, okay, if it was against the law to write about the border, to write about racism, to, if, if it was against the law to write about all these themes, how would I tell the story? So I was, I, so to me, it's like, how do I approach these, th these themes like, you know, these themes that are these heavy themes that are in the book without really it being about these things you know it was really it was almost like trying to for the lack of a better word smuggle these concepts and these things into the story under the reader's nose or under like a fake editor's nose so I wrote it almost like a performance you know to as a performance to put myself into the shoes of this imaginary writer who couldn't write about the border and how would how would I go about it and this is just the way these themes unfolded with the, keeping those things in mind as I wrote as I wrote the book and it was easier for me to do it like I said because it was in this time span of three months that I wrote the first draft so it was easy for me to just be in the zone and not have to go in and out of the zone and uh, uh, like for instance, if it would have taken me like a year and a half, I think it would have lost a lot of, a lot of the elements that are in the book. So, so that's how I try to, I guess, approach projects now. Like in a, some, I try to find the performative angle of it and the way that would be beneficial to the story. I have a question. Uh, I'm Sophia, by the way. Thank you so much for coming to speak to us. I loved reading your book. It was really fun for me. I'm from California, so uh, oh. I'm pretty far south too. So I really liked this book. It was uh, really cool. Thank so you. I guess my question's a little sillier, but um, we were kind of wondering why the truffle pig only ate baby carrots. You know, uh, to me, this is a funny question because uh, I was asked about that very thing recently, you know, and uh, I I thought to myself, you know, m you know, I thought a lot about my father, my father, uh, who, I guess, who is a certain generation, her certain type of Mexican man, my father. So I thought a lot about, you know, if my father had this f f truffle pig, what, what would my father do? I would think about like, what, what would my, my dad do? And I'm like, okay, I somehow I came to the conclusion that my dad would put him in a bathtub with like a towel or something and like, just give it carrots or whatever. And, uh, and, uh, and I guess he did that because he saw the young woman at the party uh, give it a carrot too. So I guess because of that connection, he did the same thing, you know? So I'm like, okay, my dad would do what he saw somebody do with it, which is give me a carrot. I don't know. <laughs> so that's why I just, whenever I had like a weird question about Bellacosa, I was like, okay, what would my father, you know, and to understand like Mexico, like in the early nineties, like when their economy crashed and their, their coin devalued, 
I thought about that kind of Mexican man who lived through this era of Mexico, where it was where a middle class actually prospered and was able to exist. And then all of a sudden, like the boom, the harsh reality, you know, the, the elimination of the middle class and just survival. And I'm like, OK, what would my father who had experienced these two Mexicos, what would he do? And if, you know, I thought about in, in the reality in Truffle Pig, I thought about it as like a really like a shitty futuristic 80s, you know, that's how I always thought about the technology and the things in here, you know, it's like the 80s. The technology, there's like technology in there that seems kind of limited and stuff. And it was all just falling back to these ideas of like, okay, the 80s at the time and Mexico and the border. I don't know. These mentalities that don't exist will be gone by then. I was trying to document this mentality, I guess, even if it's in this, I guess, speculative way, you know. Thank you for your question. Thank you. So in, that's really. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go well, I was. Sense. I was. I was just. I want. Uh, I had a follow up question. So if you had something you wanted to say about. No, I was just going to say more. I can really briefly, just more generally, that it's so cool to hear those things because we were talking about like in class with your book, but also with other books we've read. Just things that the writer the writer knows the world more than they than they put on the page right and you can feel that and we could, we could feel that in there but it's also the cool thing about actually talking to the the author about their book is that sometimes then you can learn cool details about that when we when we talked to um Sophie McIntosh we, we asked her questions which was like you didn't need to know it for the book but it's like fun to hear um because you get that feeling you know the author knows the whole universe more than they've put on the page and they don't need to put it on the page right but you get that feeling of it so yeah mason you go ahead well i was just curious so de-extinction is you know a big topic right now in genetics and in biology and i was curious as to how you landed on on de-extinction as the sort of way to tell the story that you wanted to tell you know i thought a lot about these uh, i guess uh you know, this technology, this, if this, this technology existed in the hands of people, you know, what would they do? What is the worst thing that somebody would do with this technology? And I'm like, okay, let's say you could bring a unicorn back to life. And even if it just exists for six weeks and then it just rots, you'd still pay a lot of money to have a unicorn walking around your house or your yard for like two weeks to show off to your friends if you can afford it and stuff. And that's what would happen. I think that's what would literal ha literally happen. So, you know, I thought about, you know, these mythologies that would exist and even uh, monetizing the mythologies with this, uh, with uh, the truffle pig, you know? So in many ways, I wanted, to, I wanted the story to end where it begins, I guess. I forget who said, I think it was Sam Shepard who says that his favorite stories are the ones that end with new beginnings, you know? So uh, so I thought a lot, so in the end, like the discovery that happens in the end, I'm not afraid of revealing anything because y'all have read it already, but this discovery of like, there being like this underground, you know, syndicates or cartels that are make, bringing these imaginary creatures back to life. I mean, to me, that's horrifying, you know? That's like, oh my God, you know? And I almost, I thought about, I thought a lot, a lot of my, should be a dragon. I'm like, at the end, I almost made it a dragon. You know, I thought of like having a dragon in there, but I'm like, no, it's less, it's less visual. A giant, a, you know, a dragon is just a lizard, a big dead lizard, you know? I thought about having all these deranged horns, you know? I thought about these scientists trying to perfect this, unicorn and not getting not the you know the horn right you know so and uh as far as like the genetics and things went you know it just to me it was just natural like okay like if you have a certain kind of technology and there's a scarcity of food you know there'll be people who would mass produce food even if it's a fake food you still eat it i thought about like space powder like that powder they give to like astronauts that is like, I don't know, like supposed to be like Turkey and stuff. And it's just like a paste or whatever. Like, 
So I, yeah, I thought about these elements, these existing elements, and to bring it into this, this, this absurd technology that falls into the wrong hands, you know. We talked a bit last week about um, sort of, we, we, we debated a little bit about the difference between Bellicosa and Paco Herbert and at how at times Paco Herbert felt more involved in the world than Bellicosa. And I was just kind of wondering uh, what your process was with deciding to make uh, Bellicosa the main character and what sort of Paco Herbert, what his role serves. Um, Cause we sort of felt like at times he felt like he should be the main character, but then there's also this smaller, more personal world that, that Bellicosa is living as well. You know, that's interesting. You know, that also reminds me of, you know, I hate to make the comparison because people hate this movie, even though I think it's great, but I love Citizen Kane. If you watch Citizen Kane, it's, it's two, there's two movies in Citizen Kane. And Citizen Kane is the reporter finding out about Kane and discovering his things. And you hardly ever see his face. His face is like in the shadows. You see all these faces. You see him talking to these faceless reporters. And then there's the other story, which is the story of Kane, which is all just through this, through these flashbacks, you know. So I thought a lot of, I guess that's in, that was in the back of my mind uh, working on this. Uh, Paco Herbert being the the person who has like a different angle of it than Villacosta does, but in a way also, yeah, you you're right because. Uh, Paco Herbert is the one who gets a story going, who moves the story. He's the one who kind of manipulates uh, Bella Cosa into being, going to this dinner with him, you know? So I, at the time when I was writing this, uh, I had no idea that Paco Herbert was going to be a character, you know? I wrote the scene where he goes into the, he goes into a monologue talking about like the dialing of Dr. Moreau and stuff like that. And that just came naturally to me. And I was, and as I kept writing, I was like, who the hell was this character? Like I had a rule when I was writing the story where I would not have anything that was that would not come back later on in a narrative. Like whatever it was, whether like it's a character, there's only only in the second half of the book, Villacosa runs into one or two people who we never see again. But in the everything that happens in the first half of the book, I wanted it to come back somehow in the second half of the book. So so when uh, I had this character go off into the Dr. Moreau monologue, I, would, I was like, who is this character? I, I really had no idea, you know, as, as I, I wrote, honestly, and I'm going to be 100% honest with you, with all of you, I really had no idea what I was doing until I was like three fourths of the way to this novel. And, and, I, and I had no idea how I was going to end it. I didn't know anything about it until I finally figured out, okay, this is how it's going to end. This is where I'm going to go to. Uh, and it wasn't until I guess I finished it and I finished my first draft that I read it. And I was like, I don't know what this, I still didn't know what it was. I had to really understand what I, I, I had written, you know, and I was the kind of writer who, uh, who almost nobody read any of my stuff. And it wasn't really until I, I got an agent that she was able to see the things in the book that I was not able to see. And uh, to be 100% honest, I went to like at least three or four more drafts with my agent where I was able to flesh out a lot of things in there, you know, I, because this was my first time writing anything crazy like this. Before this, my writing was all like very... I don't know if autobiographical, but there was a lot of biographical elements in my work. And I came to the crossroads in my life where I was like, okay, am I gonna finish this novel? I had this novel, I had over 120,000 words and I still had no way, I didn't know how I was gonna finish it. So I abandoned that project altogether and just wrote what I thought at the time was, was the most unpublishable thing I could possibly write, you know? And that's what was fun to me about it, you know, thinking that, okay, I don't think that anybody's ever done things, there's things in this book that I've never seen anybody do. And to me, it was like the most unpublishable thing I could have done at the time. That's what was exciting and frightening at the same time, but I knew I needed to finish it, you know. 
I had no idea what the question was or if I answered it anymore. <laughs> so, but thank you. Um, since you since you brought it up, talking about like the, the publishing process, etc., um, that's something I, I I did think while I was reading your book because I, I I do read a lot of contemporary fiction partially for pleasure, partially because I'm a grad student, uh, and that's definitely not for pleasure. Everything I read for that, but um, and it just your your novel struck me as something like very different from a lot of, of contemporary fiction, like especially you know like yeah very contemporary stuff that that. I mean, again, it's it's such a huge thing, contemporary fiction, that this is like a super generalizing statement. But at the same time, there are like what you were saying before when 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 you were talking about the fact that there's writers who say you should never start a sentence with of, oh, right? Mm -hmm. And and you know, and in general, when when you take like workshops, I I, I did I took some creative writing workshop in Italy when I was much younger, long time ago. I'm Italian, and there's always like a lot of rules at this time, you right? Like never write about writers or you know whatever and 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 it is and especially when you're like someone who's just like I guess this is your first novel right before you publish short stories and so if I you're will. okay sorry. you say like if you feel like you're yeah you, you in any case you know like you're young you're, you're a young writer I'm just wondering like what, what what were like the politics and the dynamics with the, with the publishing because you really like for and I mean this in a good way. This like novel does not sound like it's coming out of an MFA. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You know. Well, to be honest, you know, one of the things that was difficult after uh, I had an agent is trying to come up with what they call comp titles. And is uh, and what is it, Misha? Is it comp? comp, comp, comp what is it? Yeah, comp I guess. I, don't know. I guess they're meaning like. Comparative, maybe I'm not sure exactly what we're. Oh, competition. I thought it was competition. You had to say like, okay, what are you competing with out there that is like that is out there? I don't know. That's an interesting way to think of it. I think I always thought comp titles meant comparison, but competition. Uh, but it's probably also competition. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. like they're I mean, like so people shorthand right so that that yeah. like editors can be like, oh, it's like if you like. I mean, I'm even just looking right now at like I have Parable of the Sower here on my desk, and they say pairs well with 1984 or the handmaid's tale right like they're yeah. like oh yeah 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 like that like like so it was but it was hard to come up with comp titles as far as like other like mexican american writers and stuff like and uh i had uh, when i was looking for an agent uh, i discovered that the big i guess mexican american writers in 2014 or 2015 at the time or from the past 20 years or we're all represented by the same one or two agents so when i got rejected by that by those agents i was like my career is over that's it nobody is going to be behind me again and if you see the kinds of books that these mexican-american writers wrote it's all very like realist and very uh very in very much part of a certain established tradition uh so you know, I, so like I said, because I was going through all, you know, I was, I was like 31, 32 years old. So I was going through a lot of uh, crossroads in my creative life. So like I said, I wanted, like I said previously, I wanted to write uh, the most unpublishable thing out there. And I guess I say that facetiously in a way, but I forgot what the question was. Can you tell me what the question was again? I'm sorry. I think the question was very vague too, right? I just I was just asking like how 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 what was your relation with, with with the whole like publishing apparatus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so when I was looking for an agent, I'll start here. When I was looking for an agent, I sent out over like a hundred queries, and I had no idea how to write a query or anything like that. And in the process of writing these queries, uh, I kept revising it and making the description of the book tighter and I kept getting little publications and small victories as a writer to add to my query. So I queried over like, uh, I want to say about 100 agents. And out of those 100 agents, I probably heard back from around 10 or 12 agents. 
who wanted to read the manuscript. And out of those 10 or 12 that asked for the manuscript, or only around three or four actually read it. And only mm -hmm. actually one of them talked to me on the phone about it, who passed on the manuscript. But then one of those three agents, three or four agents ended up being my agent, you know? And when she talked to me on the phone, she knew there were problems with the manuscript. For instance, uh, one of the things I didn't really flesh out the McMaster's character. And as a writer, I did a, a couple of, I'm, well, I'm sorry for the word, but I, I did a, a couple of chicken shit moves where instead of actually writing a whole scene, I would just say, and this happened and I would move on. And then I'd hope that that would be fine. And then my agent would be like, uh, I think you need to have a whole scene saying how this happened. You can't just say this big thing happened here and move on. So, you know, seeing things like that and reading it, it was like devastating because you know that you had to work on it for another six months or whatever, but it was well worth it. Although all the work that I did with my agent was really, 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 really productive. And like I said, like, because I didn't go through like a uh, MFA program or whatever, and I, because I never had that relationship with somebody read my work and give me feedback, I was eager for it. I was like, yes, please tell me, please tell me what I'm doing wrong because I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I think I've, I've done enough as to, you know, and ed I was a bad editor at the time too. I, I edited my own work, like even things now that are now just pop on the page, mistakes that I make all the time, you know, like one of the things that I, I make fun of myself for all the time because my characters are always starting to do something, you know? He started to run, he started to think this, you know? Instead of just saying he thought this or he ran, you know? People are always starting to do something, you know? They started to laugh, you know? Instead of just saying they laughed, you know? Just things like that, you know? And I'm like, my God, my manuscript is riddled with people starting to do something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, you know, just things like that, that I just never really saw myself as a writer, the kind of writer that I always was, I was always a first drafts writer. Uh, I was eager to move on always to the next project, to the next thing. So, uh, so I was very open to, to this process and I learned a lot. And I think, I think that my writing sense has become, I had, I guess I'm more self-aware as a writer, like in a positive way, I think, you know. Thank you for the question and for, for for repeating the question for me. You said earlier that you like used to go against like a lot of the like pre prescribed rules from other writers, but like through the editing process, you now have like your own set of rules, like or like a rule that you think is like beneficial. You know, uh, to uh, to be honest, like I now uh, I, I call it brains. I have different brains for things. You know, my first draft. Whenever I'm working on a first draft. I have to protect my first draft brain. You know, my 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 root my uh, what my primary thing I have as a first when writing a first draft, you have to protect your first draft brain from the editor brain and from these other brains taking over. So after I'm done with my I was done with my first draft. Okay, I'm like okay now now I'm gonna use my editor brain here and just and just not let my creative brain get in the way because otherwise I'd have these lines that don't need to be there, you know? So, uh, and in every, in every step in the process, I try to be as harsh as, as harsh on myself as possible because I know that there's people out there who will be a lot harsher, you know? So I always try to be as harsh on myself as possible, especially because I always feel that I have to work like it's harder or something. I don't know why. That's just my personal thing. But uh, so, uh, yeah, did I answer your question or I'm sorry? I seem to be going on these long things and then I was like, <laughs> what was I asked? I don't know. During that, that editing process, was there anything that like, any particular scenes that you really, really loved, but your editor brain just said, nope, don't need it, need to cut it. No, no, you know, like, because especially with this novel, because I saw, I saw every scene in this novel, 
I, I pictured the, the entire novel as the whole thing. I pictured it like a clock, you know, like a clock and every scene in this novel is like a gear in the clock to make the entire clock work, you know? So you don't want a gear in there that is superfluous, that is not really doing anything to the clock, you know? So I really had no problem doing it. And I always remembered in every step of the process, even after FSG acquired it and working with my editor there, I always remembered, okay, no matter what I, no matter what I have to do, no matter what they ask me to do, my novel is still going to be weird in the end. In the end, it's still going to be as weird as I wanted it. I'm not compromising my vision or anything at all. I'm just making it better. And in the end, all the weirdness that I wanted in there is intact, you know. So I didn't mind being just harsh on myself. I don't believe in like, I don't know, nostalgia. Sometimes I think we hold on to these sentences and stuff or scenes for nostalgia because like what Misha was saying about uh, how a writer puts in more, I mean, uh, knows more about the world than they put in, you know? Sometimes you realize, okay, that's for the, that's for the, I, I guess in I, my, my filmmaking friends call it the Bible, you know? That's for the Bible, you know, that's for the Bible of the, of the story, which is things that only the behind the scenes people know about, you know. I like that way of thinking about it, too, because it's like, you know, people, whatever, people talk about like, like, oh, you don't want to kill your darlings or you have to kill your darlings. And people talk about, oh, well, like save it, save a certain line and maybe you use it in something in the future. And I don't know about you, but for me, that just I, I don't really reuse those things oh. but thinking about it like a bible like thinking about it is like you have this stuff that's like part of it but you don't have to show it to anybody right like it just yeah 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 and i and i'm a big believer that the themes and the things you don't write about will pop up in your later work mm -hmm. in some kind of way you know so even mm -hmm. if you think there's like a gem there that you discard that gem will probably pop up something later on without mm -hmm. you even knowing it. You're like, oh, okay, this this belonged here, not over there, or something like that, you know. We could probably take like two or three more questions. I know I I have one question, but I'm gonna hold I'm gonna hold on to it and see if there's a couple more of you that have anything that you've been been in your mind that you want to ask. Something uh, another aspect of the book that we we talked a lot about in class. We're curious. Uh, the phantom recruits uh what was the sort of inspiration behind their uh, sort of intervention at the end you know i thought a lot about i guess you know how about i like the idea of like working class people like having this network this underground network within this like evil society like an underground society and you're just having just people within this network just uh report i guess i thought a lot about unions and maybe like, mm -hmm. like the wobblies and stuff like that you know uh what is that one john sales movie about the wobblies i forget about it all the time it's one of his first movies the director john sales anyway uh, chris cooper is in it and anyway, I just thought about this just network of like working class or even not even just working class, like even like the like uh, the border protector officer who is in the under who's in the phantom recruits, you know. You know, and to me, that was fascinating, you know, and also like the kink song, what is it, the Village Green Preservation Society and just these little societies or things that exist, you know, just and maybe also inspired by like the imagery of maybe comic books you know i'm not a big comic person but i did grow up around a lot of my friends are and i i, I know a lot of it through them and because of them so i wanted to have these aspects i always think that things exist because they exist in this world you know like uh i'm always 
I always intrigued with people who only write or only read like one type of fiction, one type of literary fiction, which is like the stark fiction, you know, but I think that if, you know, the Western genre exists or like the romance genre or like all these things exist because they exist in the world, you know, the, every day is like a Western, you know, and I always thought, and I wanted to write something. I wanted to put all these things on the border and I wanted to get every genre that existed and th that exists and everything and just put it in, put it on the border. Because I think that on the border, every day it's speculative fiction, every day it's a Western, every day it's a drama, you know, every day it's the three penny opera in the, in the, in South Texas, you know, so I wanted to get all these things and then just put it into the one story, like I said, in this combination of minimalism and maximalism and uh, trying to keep that balance, I guess, intact from beginning to end, you know, I, another thing that was inspiring on on it and i hate to say it also because people hate shakespeare but macbeth or whatever uh like how macbeth is like his shortest play and there's not a scene wasted in there as far as movement you know i highly recommend like uh kurosawa's adaptation of it throne of blood or whatever is a great example of it from the first scene boom the three witches every you know you know everything that's going on you know the very first scene and it, it just escalates from there and i really wanted this to be like that in my own way i guess from the very first scene this fuse goes off until the very end you know so these concepts like like i said about macbeth like what is most inspiring about Macbeth is like the concept of the and the execution rather than the content itself, you know, and that's how I, and even though I love the content or whatever, the same thing about Citizen Kane, like these abstract concepts, and also like what I said about the construct, Russian constructivist writers, like these concepts were important for me in the approach and which is why I still, I read, like right now I'm reading like essays by like Glenn Gould, you know, and I read like two, I like that I can read like two or three of those essays and I have no idea what the hell he's talking about ever, you know? So I'm like, okay, I don't know what the hell he's talking about, but conceptually I kind of do, I don't know. So I try to learn about like conceptual, like uh, the approach of like musicians, especially like Pauline Oliveros or like Morton Feldman, these composers who, you know, Julius Eastman, these composers who uh, have their own like landscape pretty much, you know. And I like to bring those concepts outside of literature and grapple with them with a story, you know, with a narrative. I love that. that was, it reminds me, I was just thinking the other day, I went to this concert that was like a tribute to Art Blakey. Um, this, and the, they were talking about how, he, because he was, a, he was a drummer, but he was also a band leader. And he was, so he was kind of like leading from the back of, mm -hmm. of the band in a way. Um, and I was like watching them and the ways that they all turned to the drummer and the band, like visually they look to see like, like where are we going next? And I kept thinking about that and how, I don't know, I don't have it quite figured out, but I feel like we could use that in writing and thinking some, somewhat about like the relationship of the text to the reader too, the of, of kind of keeping the reader on their toes, right? And keeping them so that they're always curious about where we're going next uh and it makes sense but you also kind of um yeah have to have to like keep checking in and i, I like i hadn't really talked to anybody else who heard anybody else make those kind of comparisons to um composers and to music but i think that there could be a lot of crossover there that would make sense yes yes definitely i was kind of Anybody curious about oh yeah, sorry, I was gonna say, anybody have a last question? Go for it, Larkin. Um, yeah, I was curious how you said that you had everything in the first half, you wanted to have those seeds and then sow them later. So like, how did you go about like mapping that out? Because it's like, it feels like I can like draw a line from like where it is to where it ends in the second half. So I was just kind of curious how you figured out that timeline and felt that shape. 
you know it's funny like as as a um going back to like these musical concepts and stuff like that i uh something uh, you know i thought a lot about like the yardbirds like the band the yardbirds i don't know if y'all know this or whatever you don't need to know about it but i or like some of like chopin's like frederick chopin's nocturnes how like three quarters of the way into the song, the song just destroys itself and you just hear noise, fucking noise. And it sounds like chaos. And then it goes back to like the riff of the song or the motif of the song. And you feel like that moment, that rush, you're like, oh, I'm back to like control neutral ground. So there's different parts in the book where that I allow myself to just go out there like one of the moments is when uh, Osvaldo is in like in the Rio Bravo River and there's this long monologue in there. And the scene that comes right after is a very, very like boring kind of scene of just like every day, Cosa doing everyday boring things. And, and I was like, okay, if every time I'm, if I am ever do anything fucking crazy, I gotta come back to just a normal ass thing so that I won't lose the reader, you know? So as far as like the first half of the book, I didn't really map anything out. I just, it was more like reaching, reaching a milestone or something. Like for instance, I knew when I was writing it, I knew I needed to put the truffle pig in there, but the truffle pig doesn't come on there until like a fourth into the book, probably a hundred pages into the book. You finally see the truffle pig or something like that, because I, uh, and for a couple of reasons, one is that I like it. I like when I'm, when I'm reading a book and I forget what the title, I forget that the title of the book means anything. And then you, all of a sudden you come across a part of a book and then all of a sudden the title comes into play and the reader and all of a sudden the reader makes these connections. So even though I had no idea how I was gonna map to get Bea Cosa to the dinner party, for instance, where he would first see the truffle pig. I knew I needed to get there, but it was a matter of how, you know? So every time I needed to get somewhere in the book, like for instance, I knew that the first half was gonna end with Osvaldo, with Bea Cosa finally seeing his brother, you know? But how I got there or anything, how I got there or what happened in between, I had no idea, you know? I just knew that I needed to get there. And I had comfort knowing that, even though I didn't know how I was gonna get there, just knowing that something had to happen made it easier for me to be like, okay, at least I, at least I know I'm gonna get there. And uh, also like when I knew, when I had a vision of the ending, I, I was like, okay, I knew it was gonna end with Bella Cosa walking off into the desert, you know? But it was a matter of how am I gonna get there, you know, that it's just, you know, and it's like, like I said earlier, and I hate to make the, compar the comparison once again, but it's like a bank robbery. You're like, okay, you need to walk, you know, you need to walk out with the money and you kind of know you need to do these things. But what happens in between the, in the chaos that makes come up, you're going to have to grapple with that on to, in order to get out the door, you know. That's cool to hear you talk about the like, like having a like, boring or everyday scene following up something kind of crazy because we we actually talked about that in class about how when Bea Cosa goes and like has his soup he goes to baby grand central to Marcelita's and has his soup like we always felt like it was like a breather for the reader like we get to like be like ah oh, like we didn't actually think it was boring but it's but it's like it was like calm right and so uh, then yeah, I call it like a bucolic scene or whatever mm -hmm. just this guy going to get tacos when I finished this book I was like oh my god I just wrote a book about this guy driving around in a truck you know pretty much <laughs> this guy's just driving around the whole time but then I thought about it in South Texas that's what you do you drive everywhere you know that's so I don't know and you think about Don Quixote they're always on horses just talking and talking you know yep. so that's yep. how I excuse those things for myself <laughs> Well, and it's also neat to hear you talk about like knowing, right, that you needed to reach somewhere about how you're going to reach there. Um, I forget who, but there's there's some writer that I read a quote from where they talked about like um, places in their novel as like, like, like things that they were going to reach towards as like islands, right? Like knowing the furthest off island, but you don't really want to know how exactly you get there. You just kind of 
figure it out, but that having that is important because then you do at least have somewhere to work towards. Yeah, definitely, definitely, I agree. Well, um, if if anybody else has another question, we we can go for it. But I, I also definitely wanted. I know so you have a both a collection of short stories and another novel. Oh yeah, I have a collection. I just wanted you to talk a little bit about it. Yeah, definitely. You know, I have a cover reveal tomorrow. Tomorrow my cover is revealed. So oh, awesome! My collection of stories called Valley Esque. Uh, and uh, it's, yeah, it's a collection of short stories uh, that are kind of, you know, it's a mixed bag. I have 14 stories in there. Uh, some of them are kind of crazy. Some of them, I have a couple of them that are stories that I've never, uh, I guess I cover land and territory that I never really got to with Truffle Pig and every one of these stories. So it's, I, I, I feel that I'm happy that I got to, uh, I got to, you know, explore all these other influences and things uh, that are important to me, you know, within this work, you know, and, you know, something interesting, something interesting that I learned, I guess, in putting together this short story collection is, you know, I approach it, I listen to a lot of like records and stuff and how, you know, how a song, songs are arranged and the moods of a record, you know, and you know, and, and and the landscape of the record, I'm like, okay, this is, it starts out, you got you have this little uh, minute long instrumental song as your first track, and then this poppy second song or whatever, you know, things like that, or just exploring the landscape of it. And, and my new novel, I just turned it into my editor like three weeks ago and two weeks ago, and I don't think he's even read it. So I'm happy with him not reading it for a while, really. I'm like- It's I, good to have that break, huh? Uh, yeah. And, and, yeah, and it took me it took me five years to write this one as opposed to three months for <laughs> this one, you know. So, uh, so I like having these different approaches, you know. For uh, I, I think a project or your story will tell you how to work on it, and I think it's also important to. Uh, I know I wasn't asked this, but to write stories in different ways, you know, like uh, to. Uh, you know, I heard a Bolaño, this is a, a, a quote by Roberto Bolaño, he says, that I agree with, where he says to not work on just one story, to work on like three or four stories at the time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you kind of risk repeating yourself if you just work one story at a time. So if you had like three stories, you'll be like, okay, I'll write this one when I'm feeling this way. And mm -hmm. I'll write this other story when I'm feeling this other way. Or I'll write this story when I'm over here in this area or whatever, you know, so... Uh, I appreciated that aspect of writing short stories as opposed to like a novel where you're just like, you're just like in this trance and you're just like, oh my God, is this ever gonna end, you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely, yes. Okay, anybody, any, any last minute comments, questions, anything? I have a quick question. I know we're almost at the end of our time, but um, you mentioned that you always knew that you were going to end with Bellicosa walking into the desert, and I'm just kind of curious as to as to why you knew that was the ending point where you were where you at where you, where you were at in the story. Uh, because in the part where Paco Herbert is reading about the prophecy and the lost prophecy, maybe I'm giving too much away here. You know, there's things in there. I want all, all the answers are in the book, but. Sometimes I feel, but sometimes I feel I give too much away. But when he just he sees that uh, the the Aranaya people uh, when they walk into the desert with the troubled pigs in their imagination, so uh, there's a certain point in the narrative where Paco Herbert tells this to Bayacosa, and Bayacosa gets it in his mind again, again, once again. Bayacosa sees or hears somebody do this, and it just comes in his mind like the carrots or thing. So I knew that Bayacosa, after hearing this from Paco Herbert. Would, would end up doing this, what uh, what he would hear, what he heard that the Aranayan people did in this prophecy with the with the, the pig, what they call it, El Cerdo de los Sueños or what they call it. So I knew that that's, that's what would happen because, because Bea Cosa was exposed to this part of the mythology. And I knew that the mythology, the prophecy needed to be fulfilled. And I, and I thought about this also about, you know, if, a, a, you know, if somebody, Let's say if you manufacture a prophecy and it comes true, does it is it, does that mean the prophecy came true? You know, so these these questions were uh, were important for me. Like if Bella Cosa heard about this prophecy or whatever the hell, 
and somebody had made this prophecy and if it if it happens if somebody willingly does this you know, i don't know is this still part of the whole thing i don't know i grapple with all these uh, all these tough questions in it and uh, even though it seems like it seems like abstract the ending is actually very uh, i guess i i i calculated it because i needed it like i said i didn't i wanted every scene in there to be a part of another scene within the narrative you know including the ending It's been so nice to talk with you. Um, and uh, these are great questions. This has been really, really fun. Thank you so much for having me, Misha. Thank you all for reading yeah. the book and for all your very, uh, very, uh, uh, very intelligent questions. And, and I really, really appreciate you having me here. It means a lot. Yeah. To me.